And welcome back, everyone, to another edition of Going for Two, presented by our good friends at Home Field Apparel. I am your host, the publisher of the Extra Points newsletter, Matt Brown. I am joined here by my D1 Ticker colleague, Brian Fisher. We apologize for the schedule being a little bit different this week. There's, as, as you can imagine, there's a lot going on in the world, particularly here in the United States. We're recording here on a Wednesday afternoon. Normally, we do this on, on, on Tuesdays. And... I think now there's a lot less anxiety in the world now that we know all the votes have been tabulated, all of the elections done, and we can see now very clearly that University of New Orleans students do not want to pay an extra fee to add football at their university. That's, that's what we're all freaking out of, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was. I saw that as, as soon as I saw that news release, I was like, you know what, Matt Brown is absolutely going to say something about New Orleans football in, in this release. But you know, I, I mean, part of the reason that we were delayed. Yep. Hopefully, I don't sound too bad. Uh, feeling a little under the weather. Surprisingly, amount of people that I've talked to, right? It, maybe it's just this week or, or this past uh, couple of days, but it feels like uh, the, the flu bug is certainly going around. We we saw it impact uh, you know Texas A and M, a few other football teams, but it's uh, yeah. impacting everybody else involved in college athletics too, and that that includes us. No, I, I, we're in a, a, a similar boat. I'm feeling okay. My, my kids have, have, have gone back and forth a little bit with the crud. I mean, like th this is, this is the thing you forget COVID for a second. And thankfully that that isn't the case in either of our homes right now, but um, this is the time of year when everybody associated with a fall sport is going through injury management. Um, and that includes the athletes, all of whom are banged up and bruised and and are not at the peak of, of of their physical condition. It's also true for the administrators and the writers who have been pulling, you know, long weekend shifts and, and long evenings. And you do that for a couple of months, your immune system starts to fade a little bit. And if you have small children at home or are exposed to somebody who has small children, they are probably going to an elementary school or daycare facility, which is the least hygienic place in the entire world. Um, you know, our, our children are going to go off to daycare. They're going to come back with tropical diseases, not even native to North America, because that's what three-year-olds and four-year-olds do. So have some grace for the people in your world that are feeling like garbage right now, especially if they live where, you know, where I am, where now the sun sets at 3.30 and nobody has any vitamin D anymore. We're doing great. We're doing great. Um, I will admit, though, I'm doing a lot better now than I was last week. And you and I have not had a chance to talk about this on the air because of our sketches have been so weird. but. Um, do, where were you last Saturday? Were you you were in a press box, right? No, I I, I was at home just uh, because home. of because of the bugs and and uh, keeping everybody right. at at home. But uh, I got got to watch a lot of football. Uh, some of it good, some of it bad. I, I think it was fun to see a lot of the weather events uh, around the country. I was actually talking with a special teams coach uh, the other day. You know, just talking about how, how they prepare for things and you know the spraying of the water on the, on the footballs. But it sounds like that that kind of came in handy for a few games, including the one you were at. Yeah, that, that's definitely true. I'm glad that you were at home. I'm glad that you were recovering a little bit. Normally, I do most fall Saturdays for my home office or sometimes at a friend's house where there's multiple televisions. But I do try to go to games uh, as a reporter a couple of times a year. I'm going to one next week. But last week, I decided to do something I don't do very often, which is go to a football game as a fan. I went. I, I'm, I live in Chicago. My father-in-law lives in Evanston. He teaches at, Kel uh, at Kellogg, which is Northwestern's business school. And I thought, you know what would be some fun father-in-law uh, father son bonding experience here? And I invited my, my, my brothers and my brothers-in-law, too, who are all unfortunately working. Let's go to the Ohio State Northwestern game. Tickets shouldn't be terribly expensive. Um, this, the, you know, this is a chance for me to be in my natural habitat. I get to watch my, my alma mater and get to be in the stands. It should be fun. So we went, and I bought these tickets without knowing that we would be facing a hurricane level weather event in Chicago. And this was true, I guess, in a lot of the country, certainly within the Midwest last Saturday. And I have to, I have to tell you guys something. This was a thoroughly <laughs> unpleasant experience on almost every level. And you can't totally blame Northwestern or Ryan Field for the fact that we had 70 mile an hour winds and it was pouring rain uh, for a third of that time, no, 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 anywhere you are, it's going to suck to be outside. But one of the things I was thinking about that I, I don't think about as often, because normally when I'm at these stadiums, I'm in a press box or I'm at places that are gigantic. But even if you have relatively modest attendance, and I'm guessing there might've been, I don't know, 30,000 people or something actually at that game. When they have to leave the bleachers because of a weather event or something, or because it's halftime and they all want to go to the bathroom, they all go into the tunnels, right? Or and and those pathways are not 
nearly equipped to handle everybody in the stadium being in there at once, which means then that you're just shoulder to shoulder, face to butt with an unmoving crowd that, I mean, that can't even like literally exit the stadium. And I remember sitting in there thinking like, forget the fact that there's no cell service here, which is unusual for a stadium that's not even close to actually full. It, you, you, it, w- w- once you get onto Ryan Field, you, 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 you can't text or do anything. But I was also thinking, there, I mean, if there was a stampede or if there was, if somebody heard a gunshot or if they heard like, uh, if you had to evacuate the stadium, I would be legitimately afraid for my life. Um, because this, and it's not because I think Northwestern did anything irresponsible. It's just like this facility is not built to accommodate this number of people in this confined space, space trying to leave. And I don't even know how you alleviate that, but like that in my mind and the garbage weather and the fact that this is a, a kind of a prehistoric stadium that's really, I, have you been to Ryan Field? I, I've been to Ryan Field, but not for a game. I, uh, Northwestern has never risen to the the, the <laughs> level where it's taken me to, to actually go cover a game there. Yeah, I, I would say, and this I don't mean this entirely pejoratively, it reminds me a lot of some of the really good high school fields from where you grew up um, in terms of like how the, how the bleachers are laid out, where the scoreboard is, what the concessions uh, and, and amenities and bathroom situations like. I think if you were at McAllen or something or some suburban DFW program, it would it would be a slightly larger version of that. And I just remember thinking like, I don't blame anybody who doesn't want to go to this experience because if the weather's bad or if there's some other kind of mitigating event, it's very unpleasant. It's not super easy to get to. Parking's a disaster. But even if everything was perfect, I, as much as I like being, appreciating the spectacle of college football and being around everything, I would have had a better experience at home, which I, I, you know, I kind of being there reminded me of like, oh yeah, this is why they're trying to basically tear this whole thing down and build a newer, more intimate, more modern stadium. Because regardless of the fact that Northwestern football sucks this year and has been mostly unwatchable even when they're good, unless you like gentrified Iowa football, which I do not, other people do. Um, it's That was my first experience in a while of going to a stadium where I thought like the actual facility has made this experience a little bit unpleasant. Has, have you ever had a moment like that for you? Like, I'm guessing you probably don't go as a regular fan to college football games very often you're generally working is there can you recall a time in your life and you're like my experience at this event is diminished because of where it where it is and what's happening outside well the the first thing that come that comes to mind is is not a, a football uh, event is it's just going to the oakland alameda coliseum and uh you know yeah. the a's games uh raiders games back in the days i mean that that place rightfully so has is is labeled a dump and, and it certainly is and, and that is that, when, is that when the comes, where the plumbing doesn't work and you can like see like like piss on the floor and stuff yeah because, you know because... a couple rats running around that sort okay. of thing cool, you know cool, the, cool. that that came to mind uh first and foremost i i, I don't know necessarily know uh in terms of college football uh just because you know you Typically, the stadiums nowadays, um, you, you do have the, you know, you're, you're in the press box anyway. So uh, yeah. the, the biggest exposure I would have typically is, you know, kind of getting, trying to get down to the field. If, if I don't want to take the elevator, which oftentimes you, you don't, you, you either want to file out the deadline and, and you don't want to wait around for, for the elevator. So, yeah. so you go out it's, in the crowd. It's slow and it's overcrowded and there's always yes. like a, a line. Yeah. Everywhere. Um, but you know, I mean, like th- there's definitely places, you know, I, the, the Rose Bowl back in the day before they kind of redid some of it. Um, you know, I, I remember just the, the crowded nature of some of those tunnels trying to get down to the field. It was, it was always a, an unpleasant experience, but you know, this, this is the, the, the case, you know, with, with some, a lot of older stadiums and, and that is what Ryan field is, is a, an older stadium. And you can yeah. understand, especially look at the, how, how fancy those renderings look like, uh, you know, why this, this could be a tear it down and, and uh, build it back up a uh, type of situation. Yeah, I, I I am fascinated about that particular place specifically. And I recognize that not everybody tuned in here just to talk about Ryan Field, but like the, beyond the fact that the the existing facility isn't great, and you know, if like for me, like I could walk there because my in laws live in Evanston, and I could just park in their driveway and go walk. It's not a super convenient place for public transit or from highway access, and it's in kind of a residential part of 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 the city. But you, if if you replacing it. And making it smaller, they're looking at 35,000 seats and, and different sight lines and modernizing it. All of that sounds great. And I think even if they wouldn't admit it in public, if we talked to every Power 5 athletic director and said, we're going to blow up your stadium with dynamite and you're going to rebuild it. How many of you are going to rebuild your stadium with like 75% of the current capacity? I think most people would say yes. Places that are uh, that were closer to like what TCU or Utah have in terms of capacity I think would be far more the standard than a 90 or 85,000 seat or, or a 
above uh, kind of facility outside of a handful of exceptions. But there's also the, you, yeah, it's well, interesting yeah. you mentioned yeah. Utah because that is actually one of the few stadiums that, that I have have They're expanded. Make it bigger. Yeah. And, and that, that's mostly because it was kind of smaller to, to start off with. But, uh, you know, I, I remember back in the day going to the old Stanford Stadium. You know, that that place was was definitely down there. But, you know, the new place, uh, certainly even even now, you know, a little bit probably too big. But uh, they, they downsized quite quite a bit from the old stadium, which ended up hosting, you know, Super Bowls and, and all that back in yeah. the day. But, uh, you know, the, the new place is, is gleaming and, and the seats are nice. It's just it's just a nice. The, the fill of, of, of the, the home team there but yeah maybe maybe that changes when the product's different M- maybe not i know i we, we we can you know they're they're fighting their students right now over whether they support fun or something yeah. which is well a, a different I, I think issue. that the important yeah. thing is you know in terms of the right sizing nature of, of of football stadiums is it can be difficult a little bit you know I, I think if you're certainly in big 10 territory where you do have those massive alumni bases you know yeah you can go on the bigger side but if you're out west in the pac 12 uh, if, i think that's been been something that that a lot of the Pac-12 schools have looked at, you know, I, yeah. I think the Husky Stadium when, when they redid that uh, downsized a little bit uh, from, from their peak capacity there. But, um, you know, the, the, it, it's not just about amenities. It's, it's about making sure that you can provide that premium experience. And you know, a lot of times when we talk about downsizing, it's maybe not footprint wise uh, downsizing, but it's, you know, taking out, you know, here, here's let's let's take out three rows here and we can make a put it put in a suite. We can maximize our revenue per square footage. And, and I think that's what a lot of athletic departments are, are really focused on is, is not just just the capacity, but but actually maximizing that revenue from from what you got on there. Because sometimes a, a lot of these on campus stadiums, in, in particular, you're just simply landlocked, you know, and, and you can't really yeah. kind of do anything. So uh, that, that is kind of the, the primary driver there. It, it is. You're, you're right. You are landlocked. You can't move you, the university to the suburbs. You can't do what the Chicago Bears might be doing, and you know, slip off to Arlington Heights to go to have a, a bigger footprint or, or more flexibility. It's pretty rare to do that if you were on campus to then move off campus, especially because it's hard to get students to actually go uh, to that kind of thing. But, you know, with the Northwestern situation specifically, you also have political considerations. And this is already coming up here. I saw with the the Chicago Tribune story, which I can drop here in in the show notes. Like there are Evanston residents that are the, 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 the concern I think I saw in the Tribune was you have people that are worried about the new Ryan Field becoming like Wrigleyville which is deeply funny because it assumes that anybody would go to Evanston to have a party at any time at any, on any level um, and, or, or that you were going to get those kind of crowds or have that, those number of games. So if we're looking at the stadium being used 15 times a year, maybe, you know, for things in, in, in independent of football, but it, it, you know, there's a reason this place doesn't have permanent lights. There, there's a reason it doesn't have a gigantic parking lot. It's because people who bought houses there in the, in the fifties who have lots of money and want to go argue at city council meetings are going to raise hell to prevent it. And this is an issue at Stanford. It's an issue with, at Cal. It's an issue in other places that are in really residential. Even if you have the money, which is hard to raise, you, there's a lot of people that have nothing to do with the school that are a factor as you're trying to figure out what you want to do with your stadium. Well, I mean, this this was a, a big point of contention in Los Angeles for got two decades, you know, right? Yeah. Just in terms of, you know, there was always the thought that an NFL team could come back. They could use the Rose Bowl. But uh, the people there in Pasadena, every time that kind of story would start leaking out, every time the, those residents of Pasadena uh, would be up in arms. And and I mean, I, I think they're still in arms, uh, up in yeah. arms over, over pretty much anything that has to do with the Rose Bowl outside of like the, the six Saturdays uh, that UCLA, uh, you know, uh, I guess are allowed use of, of the stadium. But uh, it, it, it is it is something to kind of keep in mind is you know the, just relationships uh you know with with the local community I was, I was talking with somebody at texas uh you know going through their master planning situation and where they're they just added their, their new basketball arenas that they had to move some things around to, to do new tennis courts and whatnot and, and you do have to involve a lot of you know local partners uh in that and, and make sure that uh, the community is okay with what you're doing because uh, if not you know what that, that project that might take uh you know two years in, in terms of the planning document it might take three years you know you, you might get an, an extra environmental report or something like that and then it just continues to drag out so you, you know for, for a lot of these universities you, you do have to work with the local community not just uh in terms of making sure that the facilities yep. is, is right for for you but but also for the community itself there the 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 point that you made earlier about maximizing revenue and footprint i think is interesting especially given a, a it reminded me of a conversation i had earlier this week if, if uh, on extra points for our paid subscribers, which I would encourage all of you to become, uh, it is a better use of your eight dollars a month than subscribing to whatever it is Elon's asking you to do right now. But I, I talked to some folks at Utah Valley University, which is a most mostly commuter school in 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 uh, uh, not not super far from from Provo. I think it's in Utah County. My, my Utah geography sucks, um, it, but they don't have a football team. 
and they they don't have some of the the, the gigantic infrastructure that maybe another university with 40,000 plus students has. So, but they do have I, I want to say the only men's soccer program in Utah and a very competitive women's soccer team. One that just that they just got a uh, an at large bid in the women's tournament, which is kind of hard to do when you're in the whack. Um, and what the, what the school announced that they're, that they're going to do is build a new soccer stadium. It's going to seat 3,000 people, which would be one of the largest soccer-only college stadiums in the country. And it's going to have luxury boxes. It's like we're going to have an MLS standard press box. We're going to have these 10 luxury suites. They could fit more than a dozen people in there. They're going to be climate controlled. They're going to be completely like blocked off here. We've had some success selling this here before. And we're going to make this like a a a, a, a prime facility. And it, it isn't necessarily, I think, that you're going to maybe sell 3,000 tickets to every single one of these games. Although, based on what they're drawing now, I think they could, they could, they, sh- they will continue to be in the top 10, top 15 in attendance. But th- th- by creating a premium experience, even for an event that you would think might not necessarily be premium, a UVU Grand Canyon soccer game, there might be real money on the table there. And it's probably pretty cool to watch a, a, a high level soccer game um, in, in in that kind of environment relative to just butt on a, on steel bleacher, you know? Well, I, I, I kind of go back to just in, in terms of the, the local aspect there in Salt Lake and, and I'm, I'm wearing my U S men's national team hat. We, we've got the, the world cup rosters coming out already. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I do have soccer on my mind. And, and as soon as I saw the, the project get released, the one thing that popped in, in my mind too, was not just in terms of the, the local impact there for the school, but you know, Utah and, and Salt Lake, uh, there, there's no NWSL team, but that has, is an option for the group that just purchased the uh, MLS team there. They, they have the option to bring back an N- NWSL team. And when you're talking about three, 3,000 to 5,000, uh, you know, seat stadiums, um, you know, that that's kind of right in, in line with some of the, um, you know, soccer stadiums that those those schools are in and those programs that are that are looking to kind of start up uh you know would have impact so you know you could kind of imagine not just in terms of utah valley uh soccer playing there but maybe an nwsl team before they move up uh to, to where the mls uh, franchise is that that could be an option as well uh to where you increase the usage of that stadium not just in those couple weekends a year uh where, where it's that soccer team playing at home yeah that that will be an interesting question. i didn't think to ask about that uh, I do know there's a 5,000 seat soccer stadium where like the Real Salt Lake. Yeah, team, that, that's that's a little further north. Right? That's that, yeah. that's and that's what they were saying. Like, yeah, you know, that's 45 minutes from campus, and so like you know, for us, that's not really something that we can use. And it's the same thing for where the the MLS team plays, but in an area where youth participation is super high, right? And soccer fandom is super high. To have you're right to have an have another high level facility uh, as a multi purpose. Uh, unit may may not be a bad idea other low majors have, have found that you can often make money just from like participation fees and real estate from from facilities uh to get other people to use it i i don't have easy answers for any ad or operations person this is something that i think would take a lot more reporting about what options you have to meaningfully improve that experience when you don't have unlimited funds or you're kind of landlocked or stuck in in a historic old unit I know it isn't as simple as let's just go spend a million dollars, a gajillion dollars and get some more Wi-Fi transmitters and improve that or bring in $12 Luther burgers or something like on, on some level, you want to make sure that anybody can get in not have to worry about the internet being down. If you're doing, uh, you know, no cash, anything. And this was an issue at Ryan field where like the, I tried to buy a hot dog and there's no internet and it wasn't connecting the square or whatever to, to swipe the, the credit card. So yeah, there's a long line. You can't have they, those They didn't things. give it to you for free like they did uh, in, in that Northwestern uh, Ireland game. I, well, probably because I was wearing the T-shirt, that the home field shirt that said because we couldn't go for three. Uh, it, it didn't. And it was like a student fundraiser thing. But, you know, th- these are things that are within your lo- your your ability to control. You want to as you can, you can see the game, go, you know, go take a leak without having to worry about being in line for 20 hours and, and get a hot dog. Do the ability to deliver on that w- within your budget and constraints. Uh, is, is tough. And uh, it's, it's something to think. Of. I, I think you remember the places where you had negative experiences where you won't have a negative experience though. And you don't have to worry about 80 mile an hour wins or a hot dog does not cost you $11 is that our dear friends at home field apparel. Part of that is because they don't sell any hot dogs. It's not to my knowledge. They sell t-shirts and they sell sweatpants and they sell hoodies and crewnecks and hearing rumors of bomber jackets. Uh, they have coming, one coming soon. Yeah, I and, saw uh, the, Indi- the the joggers in uh, you know a variety of colors as well. If, if you're I, I, interested in another pair, there I am. 
I, I I was not a sweatpants guy until I got a pair of the doggers and I got that because of the internet meme because it's got the sad husky on it. They are the most comfortable pack pants that I've ever worn. Um, and I, I'm not just saying that because Homefield cuts us a check every month. Like they are extraordinarily comfortable pants for uh, and and if you're a blogger like me, a journalist like me, that's a great work from home uniform. So now you can get those in a variety of colors. If you are not somebody that wants the sad Yukon Husky on your head, I, I don't know why you wouldn't, but now you have uh, a couple of other options. I'm not going to get the Indiana bomber jacket. Uh, I don't want to support the Indiana Hoosiers athletic department. If other bomber jackets did come out, would I be tempted to spend what little discretionary income I have now on something like that? Yeah. Yeah, probably. Um, you can find all that stuff on homefieldapparel.com. They are unique because they produce not only extraordinarily unique and comfortable clothing, but uh, clothing that uses vintage and unique iconography from all across college athletics. I'm wearing a home field shirt right now. It's from the University of Nebraska. It says Bug Eaters Football because they used to be called the Bug Eaters before they picked something way dumber, Cornhuskers, which is fine. Just I think Bug Eaters is really cool. Um, that is mostly what I wear when I'm I'm, I'm around the house on, on, on some level. So you can go grab some home field stuff uh, your own. They have just about every major program and a lot of less so less major programs within their, their library. And when you do use promo code extra points to save 15% on your order, you can find all of that at homefieldapparel.com. Uh, and if you are a, a licensing director or somebody that works in college athletics and you're thinking, wait, why is that my stuff on there? I should fix that. Drop me a note. I'll get you introduced with the folks over at the good brand. We can see if you can find you something there. And my email is Matt at extrapointsmb.com. Um, Brian, there was one other thing I want to talk to you about that was literal. Beep, beep, boop, 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 boop. Break, break, you know, like that? Breaking news. Uh, get a couple more subscriptions to Extra Points. We could buy a soundboard. Um, I, I, I got that capability. We, we could you, you, okay, all right, next next time, we'll, we'll get a breaking news sound for like the one time every six months where we would actually use it. While we were talking here on a Thursday, uh, a Wednesday afternoon, Conference USA has just signed their media deal. You forget about this. We've been focused so uh, laser laser focused on what the Big 12 and the Pac-12 are doing. Conference USA uh, has now cleared their own. Brian, do you have the details handy, or should I give those to the fine people about the high-level overview about what's happening here? Well, I, I think the biggest thing is just uh, you know kind of the consolidation of the rights for, for Conference USA. And you got to remember, this is a, a very much a changing membership of, of yes. Conference USA. So a lot of new schools, but uh, you know, I think the biggest focus for, at least for me, the, the takeaway from the release was the fact that uh, you know, you're, you're going to get midweek games and starting in October of Conference USA days, uh, very much like the MAC. You know, we're, we're, we're going to increase uh, some exposure. That's kind of why they did this. But um, you know, this is going to run for uh, starting in 2023, of course, uh, with, with uh, October games on Tuesday and Wednesday nights, handful of Thursday and Friday nights as, as well as you would expect. But um, Conference USA schools better get used to playing on midweek. Um, I'm sure a few of them are, are used to that uh, a little bit, uh, certainly in those early days of the season. But uh, that, that's going to be a regular occurrence where we're not only going to see the Sun Belt and the, and the MAC and whatnot uh, as, as, as uh, the, the weather at least turns a little cold, but uh, Conference USA schools are, are going to get in the mix there. And uh, they're, they're going to be doing this with CBS Sports Network and ESPN, which I, I think for, for a lot of schools out there, uh, not only in terms of the, the top level revenue figures, which are estimated, I, I've seen reports right around 750 schools. So, you know, lower, lower than that to, to initially start off. And then you can go, kind of go a little bit higher than that uh, by, by the end of the, the, the deal. But um, I think just the consolidation and knowing where your school's games are going to be on, that, that's going to be a huge win for Conference USA fans, even if it is midweek. Yeah, I, 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 I think honestly, I, I would agree that the media partner and the linear exposure is more important than the revenue number. Um, a major source of consternation among fans of Conference USA and, uh, schools, and something that I heard from people that worked for institutions that departed, wasn't just frustration about the money. And the money really wasn't great. But you had Conference USA's games that might have been on ESPN, or on a CBS network, or on Stadium, or on Facebook. Or there was an NFL network for a minute. You remember BN? Uh, or oh, yeah. BN? Yeah, right? Like the... The, the, the station that typically shows like uh, Real Madrid handball and like indoor field hockey and everything and, and European sports was also carrying Florida International sometimes. So now you're right. You know where you're going to be able to find your games on some ESPN family, presumably ESPN plus CBS Sports Network. I'm not sure at the moment if Paramount plus or any other 
uh, streaming option. Is, I would is imagine just uh, knowing how pretty much all of these deals are structured uh, lately is, is there will be that kind of direct to consumer offering uh, over the top of, as, as well, just as included as part of this deal. So uh, I'm sure not only are those games going to end up on ESPN plus, but I would imagine uh, things like Paramount plus are going to stream them, even if they are on CBS sports network on your, on your cable package as well. Yeah. CBS also getting the conference USA championship game, men's basketball championship game, women's basketball championship game and championship games in other sports like conference USA baseball may, may end up actually being, being pretty solid. So you'd be able to find that there big win. Um, I don't know how much the money matters because the difference between having worse exposure and like 1.1 million to 1.2 million and uh, 750,000, but people will be able to, meanwhile, will be able to find your game. I think at that level, even though none of these schools other than Liberty have lots of money, you would take the 750K. Like the, it, it, the sports business journal is reporting that that's going to be like a little bit less than the Mac and what the Sun Belt will be getting over the course of the deal. That's probably true, but I mean, the inventory is what we Yeah, let's face it. You know, this is there right now, right? This like, is the 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 number ten FBS league. Um, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, just for, in terms of the membership, and and I think beyond the money, which I, I think would be meaningful for for the the teams coming up, like Jacksonville State, you know, Kennesaw State, yeah, you know, seven hundred fifty for for them sounds probably probably great. I, I think less so for for the other schools, not not only in terms of the overall dollar figure, but playing on uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays and that sort of thing. Yeah, you know, I I can imagine the folks in Ruston not uh, super thrilled uh, over that potential. Um, you know, just given how how much they they enjoy you know their, their Saturdays and, and certainly playing uh, yeah. night games you know they're in Ruston they, they've got uh, you know fan base that comes from from all over the state so yeah I, I can imagine there will be a few ads that are a little cranky over this but you know what sometimes that that money and that exposure you know because this is not just a, a TV deal for for right now and in the next couple of years you know the idea behind it really is hey let's let's expose ourselves let's make sure that we you know with the new members coming in we can yeah. kind of reform Conference USA and move forward so that when that next deal uh, comes up whether it's maybe streaming partners get involved in, in that one as well maybe that's when you can kind of see the the bigger bump in terms of the, the the actual media rights revenue yeah getting into the weeds about the money is going to be fascinating because there's there's always a push and pull when you're playing on 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 weekdays and this is something i hear from so many uh fans and administrators in the mac as like we love the television exposure we love it that's become part of our brand with with Maction and the pirate flag and the, this whole part of the identity. And what that does is it allows the nation to share some ownership and to share some connection to our Mac institutions and Mac football. And that's cool. If you're, if you're a college football sicko or degenerate, whether you're in Massachusetts or Texas or Oregon, you uh, probably watch some Maction. You know what, you know what that is. You know what that identity is going to be. The people who lose on that on that though are people that live in places like Peoria and Bowling Green, and uh, and, and Central Michigan and throughout that footprint, or you know, you know Kokomo, Indiana, or something, who now recognize it's much harder for me to attend this game and be a part of it if it's on a Wednesday night, unless I live within thirty minutes of campus. If you, no one wants to go drive ninety minutes or two hours up Route seventy five to go to a Bowling Green game and then all the way back down again to get home at one o'clock in the morning on a school night or, or on a weekday. And especially when these games are all going to be in the evenings and the weather in the industrial Midwest at that time often completely sucks, which is why you might sometimes see action games where the, um, pro the on-field product can be pretty cool. And there's 4,000 people in the stands. And I would imagine that's going to potentially be an even bigger issue in conference USA, where you now have a, a, membership that doesn't really share geographic continuity and very and very few of these schools have any historical ties to each other like this was this was one of the big issues in the league beforehand was it's hard to sell tickets and get people excited for utep old dominion and you've changed that a little bit but we're still going to have kennesaw state new mexico state on a wednesday night and nobody in kennesaw is going to know anybody that's that lives or is, has any connection to the state of new mexico let alone new mexico state and getting butts in the seats will be hard. You would, I think, unquestionably make more money from a ticket sale and a, and a hot dog and a parking space world if the games were on Saturdays rather than Tuesdays or Wednesdays. So it's a trade-off. I don't necessarily know how much ahead you end up coming out by doing it this way in terms of pure dollars over a two or three year period. But when you recognize the exposure and your ability to interface with you, all of your fans and what this means for your football program, I don't know if you have a choice. So, I mean, like, 
I wouldn't necessarily, you know, stick up, just stick a feather in my cap and, and strut around and being so excited about all the money that you're getting here. Cause that's, I don't think that that's, that's the reality. But if your relationship with conference USA football or conference USA basketball is primarily through television, rather than like getting a beer in Rustin, it's probably a better thing for you. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. And I, I mean, definitely you talk with some, some ADs and, and people in, involved in development at a lot of these schools, you know, they, they do mention how, how difficult it is to make those connections that you normally get on a, a college football Saturday with, especially yeah. some of those high level donors, you know, in terms yep. of, uh, you know, they, they might, they might be busy. <laughs> they, they, they got businesses to run uh, and, and they can't get away for, for a Tuesday or Wednesday game. And when you only have, you're really six opportunities at most at, at, at the kind of group of five level, uh, cause you are getting some of those buy games. You know what? Yeah. You know, there's another lost opportunity. Not to get those people back on campus and get those warm fuzzy feelings of, of those return but uh also see the product in person and, and there's a reason that they would have to you know pony up for for things like uh you know enhanced parking or uh certainly additional seat licenses that sort of thing so i uh, there is that that negative connotation uh that, that is involved with us but at the same time I, I think you can also look at it from the viewpoint of uh, like i said looking towards the future I, I would imagine from espn and and uh cbs's perspective as well although we, we just saw that the ballot measure and California failed for, for, for legalizing sports gambling. I think that is kind of, this yeah. is another one of those moves in terms of media rights kind of viewed towards the future and saying, you know what, not only are there a lot of kind of neutrals that, that might have interest in this content midweek tuning into these games and, and you do you, you get the exposure that way, but there could be a lot of gamblers there as, as well. And with the potential for ESPN, uh, th there's been a lot of rumors. Bob Chakebeck uh, just recently, again, at, at earnings call has consistently, ref uh, you know, kind of set and teased out that uh, ESPN would have some sort of gambling uh, products, if, if you will. There's kind of some some loose ties right now, but uh, you, know, you, you got to think that, you know what, if, if you're watching watching along at home, watching a, a Louisiana Tech game on your ESPN app and you're able to bet on it, that, that can draw a little bit more attention than, than it even would. And I'm sure it's kind of part of their thinking in, involved in this package as well. Yeah, I, I don't want this. There's no way to say this without it being mean. But I think if we're being really honest in our heart of hearts, there's probably more people who are going to be watching all of a Florida international um, Kennesaw game in 2024 because they have money on it or because they have some kind of gambling interest rather than a, a fandom um, or, or a tie to the athletes or the communities themselves. And, and, and if we're being honest, a lot of that's true for the Mac. A lot of that's true for mid for mid major basketball. And I don't have good answers about the best way to program for that or who owns, you know, who owns that community or content or like the, these it's hard for me. It's a blind spot for me. Right. Cause it's hard for me then to separate my own maybe personal distaste of the gambling industry versus the need to also make enough money to provide for athlete interests. So I, I, I don't want to sit there and, you know, I, I get yelled at on a message board or something like here's Matt's anti-conference USA bias coming out here again. Like I, I don't know the best, I think you're absolutely right. I don't know the best, what, what would be the, the best way to handle those interests. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, I, I think it's uh, again, why COSA is, is kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, just given them the membership changes, just given where they are in the, in the landscape. You know, I mean, I, I think more than anything, they're probably looking at more money uh, coming through the college football playoff than, than this media deal uh, would be my guess down the road, depending on what the, some of the revenue payouts are. I know at least in, in terms of the short term, uh, if, yeah. if the, once the, the uh, 12 team gets, gets into place in, in, in 2024, that, you know, they're, they're probably looking at, uh, you know, a decent bump there. So you probably end up, you know, when you, Throw in the NCAA tournament distributions. Yeah, you, you'll be a little bit over, you know, a million dollars per school. But, um, you know, there, there's a lot of things, you know, kind of at play here, uh, not just for for Conference USA schools, but I think in terms of the general media ecosystem. And we saw uh, some additional reports this week again of, of Netflix possibly getting involved in some sports rights for for some, um, you know, kind of off off the radar uh, sports as well, like tennis, uh, right? Yeah, or, tennis, yeah. Um, volleyball. You know, I, I think some of those uh, windsurfing, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, sure. and, and you can understand as Netflix, Netflix is coming for that ass flow, like you, you better be ready. <laughs> well, as they launch an ad tier, you know, I, I think that that's going to be the, the very interesting thing to keep in mind is with Warner Brothers Discovery launching an ad tier and in terms of their new HBO Max Discovery product, you got the ES, uh, Disney Plus and, and ESPN Plus. Uh, obviously, they're launching another ad supported tier as these streamers start to launch the ad tiers. Maybe that's a where a lot of the money can come for additional sports rights because that's that's yeah. that's a differentiator that uh, Disney does have in their pocket that 
And Netflix does not. And when you're talking about churn and when you talk with all the, the Wall Street analysts, I, I know we're getting into the weeds here based off a, a conversation about Conference USA. But no, uh, when, when you talk the, with those those analysts this about is the point of this show is to yeah. get into those weeds. That's OK. But you, you talk with those those Wall Street analysts. What do they talk about? They want they talk about churn because it is so easy to turn on and off a subscription. And uh, I, I know a lot of them kind of look at the marketplace and think most families, especially nowadays, uh, given how how uh, wallets are, are getting pinched. You know what? Maybe it's only two or three services that you might want to end up subscribing to, and you might rotate on and off of, of a Netflix or an HBO Max. And what is the, the the great equalizer in terms of making sure that, especially sports fans, are subscribed uh, throughout the year? Well, it is that live sports content. And uh, you know, whether you're a Conference USA fan, I, I would imagine just given the uh, you know deals that we're seeing in the future, you know what? You're 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 probably going to be looking at uh, five or seven you know bucks a month uh, in terms of ESPN Plus or you know, Paramount Plus, like we mentioned earlier, and and that'll be uh, another component down the road of, of media deals like this. Yeah. I got to tell you guys, uh, I am acutely sensitive to the idea of subscription fatigue and of people uh, ramping up and down their various subscription commitments as they're deciding what to do with their discretionary income, seeing as that is literally my entire business. Uh, and some of these things are kind of mandatory and I recognize that some of them aren't. Um, we can have a separate conversation probably for another episode because this one's about winding down about whether this trend is good for consumers generally. I'm, I'm typically inclined to argue that it isn't. And it does stink that stuff that you did not used to have to directly pay for, you are now going to have to pay for. And in many respects, it's still a worse experience than what you had in 2009, uh, 2011 with, with, with cable television where, where HD was still pretty ubiquitous. Uh, but I could be wrong, and we don't know what other kind of functionality or anything else is is, is gonna is gonna be added here. Like, yeah, everybody is gonna have to budget five, seven, ten bucks a month if you're a college sports fan to watch the majority of stuff for your favorite school. If you're a Big Ten fan or a fan of a Big Ten institution, like I know that when this Big Ten deal starts, if I want to watch every Ohio State men's basketball game, I am going to have to pay for uh, Peacock. Um, and uh, if I want to watch every Ohio State football game over the course of like a four year period, I'm going to have to buy Peacock. Um, I would never buy Peacock. I don't even, I literally don't even know what else is like. This is what, if I wanted to watch like, like a Law and Order rerun. Um, or well, I, I, I got it for, for all well, for, 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 I'm thinking yeah, for like, for, yeah, okay. I'm, I don't watch the EPL, but if like, if but I'm thinking like non sports stuff, like there's nothing that there's would, not a whole lot there. Yeah. I mean, unless you're watching uh, a office. lot of, a lot of, a lot of, yeah, all the office is, is definitely one they, they've been, you know, spending a, a lot of the, you know, uh, stuff on original content. I, I, I put it out there yesterday. Uh, you can go on my, on my Twitter page and, and find it. Uh, some of the losses that uh, these streamers are incurring, you know, several billion dollars, even if you add it all up though, it's, it's nothing compared to what Facebook is, is blowing on, on, some of their metaverse content you know it's like eight billion dollars for disney and and warner brothers discovery yeah and uh you know peacock those all those you know like eight billion dollars worth of losses uh th this fiscal year you know, yeah 2022 it's a great and, business uh, it's it's it, it's fun uh, and, and and you know sports rights are going to continue to go up you know i saw another report out there the nba is looking to sell it to a streamer about a billion dollar a year package that's going to be a very big bellwether i think is is that those nba rights and what ends up happening to them especially in relation to the college football playoff which will be hitting the market probably right after that um you know officially so uh, yeah. a lot, lot moving on in, in in the media space and, and it's going to continue to change because I, I think everybody understands that the the days of certainly tv kind of paying for uh these streaming losses it, it's starting to be over and, and now there's there's going to be a reckoning and not only on wall street but in these boardrooms about hey how are we actually affording uh, some of this? It's one thing to to get a conference USA uh, media deal uh, done where it's kind of relatively, uh, you know, some some pennies. But when you're talking about spending on Big Ten rights, when you're talking about spending on Pac-12 rights, Big 12, you know what? There, there's there's going to be some some dollars and cents that need to get justified as well. Well, it's just there's one thing I've learned, I think, since launching Extra Points. It's that money isn't real. Buyout money isn't real. Media rights revenue isn't real. How you finance stadium construction, it's not real. Crypto is not real. None of this stuff's real. We Except definitely learned that this week. Yeah. Um, and, and, but what is real is, of course, the $8 that you might spend on a full Extra Points subscription, which gives you every single Extra Points newsletter that we publish uh, this week. That includes the dispatch, not just on uh, UVU soccer, and also included a breakdown of, uh, I've talked to a couple of college uh, SIDs about Hey, what happens to all of our jobs in the event that Twitter becomes less stable 
and maybe loses, say, 20% of its audience, which is, uh, is particularly germane to the world of sports. Uh, earlier today, as we were talking, Twitter released its new format that lets any Yahoo spends eight bucks uh, get a blue check mark. Uh, obviously, what people immediately began to do was impersonate LeBron James and Adam Schefter. And of course, those have been suspended. Everything's going great. Uh, so we talked about what that means for mid-major uh, and, and P5 departments, as well as yours truly. Um, we uh, have, have in recent memory, some other updates here about Gonzaga, Big 12, EA Sports College Football. You can find all of that at extrapointsmb.com. You can find the rest of our video and audio content on Collegiate Sports Connect and in our sister podcast, Head Coach U. Um, Brian, you just had a, a very interesting guest in, in uh, for Head Coach, Head Coach U in the last like day and a half, right? Yeah, uh, this week's episode uh, featured Ruffin McNeil, uh, former East Carolina head that's, coach. That's you know. who it was. I and, love uh, Ruffin. He's a special assistant uh, there at NC State with to, to Dave Doran. But uh, one of like I, I mentioned it during the episode. You know, in terms of the Q rating uh, of that one. Coaches just just love rough, and he is he's uh, one of the best I think in the business. Always great to talk to, but you know it was fun to to chat with him not only about his experiences in, in college football and in, even working with with Bronco Mendenhall uh, there at Virginia, but you know just you know, he he goes back to you know there there's segregationists in in the South you know back when he was growing up, and he comes from a yeah. family of educators and, and growing up in that environment, how he translates that into uh, you know there there with the Wolfpack and in Raleigh, and um, you know he he's definitely uh, one of the one of the best characters in, in all of college football. So it's great to catch up with him. Great to great to connect and, and, and talk about some of the uh, leadership uh, skills and, and and topics of uh, that are relevant to all all college football fans. So uh, be sure to check that out on the head coach U feed. And uh, we got a couple of other guests lined up for the next couple of weeks as we uh, kind of hit the home stretch here in the in the fall. We sh you should definitely make some time with Ruffin. Ruffin's got a big personality. I, I say this as somebody who's shamelessly in the in the tank for the ECU Pirates. I love that guy. They never should have fired him. The, Never should have. The, no, the, no, that 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 is the, you know, one of the three great examples I think of our lifetime of uh, of of hubris when it comes to firing a coach, especially somebody that I think went to ECU and is beloved in that part of the state. Um, if you are sick of the guy who is winning a lot of games, not winning more, by God, it could get so much worse. Um, it is the um, the Glenn Mason pro, uh, example uh, of for for Minnesota. Um, and of course, with Nebraska, um, these are, it could always get so so much oh, worse. Yeah. Well, yep. and, and Ruffin in, in particular, I mean, he he's got a fascinating not life story. Not not even just in terms of growing up, but you know, he played at ECU for Pat Dye. Uh, you know, he's he's coached with, under Mike Leach and, and now Dave Doran. And you know, he's yeah. been with Bronco. He's been with a, a lot of interesting characters. I I, I remember uh, you know spending gosh, we probably spent, sat down and, and spent twenty minutes. I, I remember when uh, Oklahoma we, when he worked with Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma, uh, and they come came out for the Rose Bowl against the, that game against Georgia. And I, I just you know was was great catching up with him then and in person and, and then again over uh, video here for head coach you but uh, definitely one of one of the great characters in college football and we, we need more roughing McNeils in, in the game that is for sure yeah for a lot of different reasons you can find all of that there that is all free uh, and of course if you enjoy this program we would uh, encourage you to uh, subscribe whether that's on Apple Spotify YouTube or anywhere else and to let somebody else know as we are trying to continue to grow this into next year and post football season uh, in the meantime I am Matt, that is Brian. You can find me at Matt Brown EP on Twitter and at extrapointsmb.com. Thank you for listening. We'll be in touch with you again very soon.